Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I may be totally wrong, but I am pretty sure um, that we're starting on Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter what? 3. 3. Okay. Verse 7. Oh, verse okay. 7. All righty. Oh, yeah, we're going to Philadelphia tonight. That's great. Yeah, Philadelphia and Laodicea, and then we'll be done with those. And then next week, we get the great joy of going into the vision of God enthroned and of the Lamb. And for those of us who are here early, just so we know, chapters four and five really determine how we interpret the rest of the book of Revelation. But we're not there yet. <laughs> but we're not there yet. Okay. So put a little bit of light on. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to mute for a minute then. All right. Good evening, as I'm looking at things just to see this one. All right, we'll be getting started in about five seconds and we'll see if anybody else joins us or maybe finally burn people out of revelation which is cool <laughs> all right it's six so uh let's pray good and gracious god for the beauty of this day that we got to experience while also knowing that there are many Many of your children who did not get to experience the beauty of this day the way we did. So we give you thanks. And while we can't understand why we get to experience the blessings and others don't, we ask that you allow us to understand that we have been blessed to be a blessing. Yet we lift up those who are suffering. And while we even may have fear that we too shall suffer in ways, may we hear these ancient words and still derive hope from them and see how our siblings of the past found hope in them too. God, we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, righty. Oh, thank you, sweetie. That's helpful. Hi. <laughs> yes, coffee is good for me sometimes, especially, you know, at six in the evening, which is not actually good for me much anymore, but I still like it sometimes because I'm tired. <laughs> All right. I would say, does anyone remember what we talked about last week? But if uh, you were here last week, I wasn't. So, oh. sorry. We were doing Ash Wednesday. And um, so, does anyone remember what we talked about two weeks ago? People, people being clad in white garments somewhere in Sardis or something. That was weird. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, people being clothed in white garments and getting to figure out some of those things. And, uh, and, and so we are going to finish up chapter three today. I can promise you that. And, um, and, and, and again, we remember that in these letters to the seven churches, we have something that is going on each time. It starts off with this to the angel of, and I will try to remember that the angel might mean the bishop, might mean some kind of spiritual angel. We're not sure. It probably means the bishop. Because the word angelos does not necessitate this winged angel that we often think of. 
um, it, it literally means messenger. And so it could just be God's messenger to that particular place. And then after doing that, these are the words of, and then it references the vision that John had in Revelation chapter one with this, uh, the risen Christ having been in this different ways. And we went through all of those when we went in Revelation chapter one, but uh, still kind of like that. Anyway, and then it goes on to the I knows. And then after I know what you've done or not done, um, it then goes into, uh, for those who persevere, this is what's going to happen. And so we've seen that now five times for these first five churches to which John is writing. And now we get to see the last two, the church in Philadelphia and the church in Laodicea. So let me share my screen here. I think this is where I was. I'm not positive. Um, I'm sure enough. So we're going to go with it. Uh, does anyone have their Bible in front of them and want to read Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13? Yeah, I'd like to do that. Philadelphia holds a sweet spot in my heart. <laughs> Run with it, Gary. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, one who has the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial which is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming soon, hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. He who conquers, I will make him a pillar of the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So we start there. And, you know, oftentimes when we're doing this, these sound somewhat problematic. As you're reading this one, how does it sound somewhat problematic? Or just first thoughts when you hear Philadelphia. I think he kind of likes Philadelphia. Um, and they're trying to do their best, but they just don't have a lot of Jews. Amen. And uh, it's one of the two churches to which John writes that doesn't get any kind of negative feedback from the risen Christ. And, uh, and, and they're doing pretty well, but they don't have much. And, uh, and so that's that kind of piece with regards to them. And we can dive into this little thing. So again, Weak but loyal, and we see that peace with an open door. Now, the reason, again, I've been providing background on all of these cities is it really helps to figure out pieces of it. So let's just go with it. Philadelphia was the newest of the cities that was written uh, to here in terms of how long it had been there. It was founded by some king who got attached to his name, Philadelphus, which again, literally means uh, lover of a brother. Um, and so someone who is, is loved his brother kind of thing. And it, it was a fascinating uh, figure. I'm not going to go into him. But he founded this particular city of Philadelphia around 140 BCE. And uh, it was founded to be a missionary center to spread Hellenism further to the east. And uh, so again, after Alexander the Great has conquered things and, and it was kind of all that way, 
while everything was conquered, you kept having this spread of Hellenism by them founding places like this and moving the Greek culture. And, uh, and this is part of the move of the Greek culture um, to help get Greek culture in that area of the world and continue to have it influenced. And this is one of the reasons that everybody spoke Greek and wrote in Greek because it was the language that was this way. It was also this, uh, it, was a, it was a commercially successful place, which again, when you're thinking of things, okay, you know, like uh, it's a commercially successful place, but the people in this church are obviously not experiencing that success. And, uh, and then, so we have that kind of piece. And the city prospered that way, especially due to grapes that flourish in the area. So it was known for wine. And, and I don't know how much you know of uh, Greek mythology still, but it was there by a center for the worship of Dionysus, which is the god of wine. So one might expect that. Now, there was a horrible earthquake. Now, we've seen how this earthquake has taken place before, but uh, in 17 CE, so uh, like AD, for those who don't understand BCE and CE, it's uh, 17 AD. And uh, Tiberius, who was emperor at the time, gave the city funds to rebuild. And as an expression for their gratitude of having these funds to rebuild, they renamed their city Neo Caesarea, um, which is basically naming your city after Caesar. And they used that name for several decades afterwards. So while it was Philadelphia, because of the money that was given by the emperor, by the Caesar, uh, Neo Caesarea, is, is how it went for a while. Now, we don't know anything about the founding of the church in Philadelphia. And if you've been paying any attention to this, we don't really know much of the founding of any of these churches outside of Ephesus. And a little bit when we, when we saw it too, maybe where Lydia was coming from. Um, but again, we're pretty sure it probably came out of an outgrowth from Paul's ministry to Ephesus. And uh, Christianity remained really vibrant there until the 14th century. And around the 14th century, anyone have any idea what happened? It's a Reformation, 14th, 1300s, right? Yeah, 1300s. Reformation is <laughs> about 500 years ago. So this is a little bit longer. Yeah. The, uh, the, the Ottomans came and, and took over vast swaths of these things as well. And so, a lot of these places became Muslim around that period of time. Oh. Um, but so Christianity, very vibrant there until then. Now, again, this letter opens with a threefold description of Christ. And these are the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no, who opens and no one will shut, who, the, who shuts and no one shall open. And so we're going to see that, and we keep having this idea about our door, so we'll talk about the door. Now, he's called the Holy One. And holy means set apart for religious purposes. Thus, you know, you have objects like the Ark of the Covenant, sacrificial animals, when we were talking about them in Leviticus, and people can be holy as well. We see that with priests. We see how God wants Israel to be a holy people. Uh, because the creator is set apart or different from all creation, God is frequently called the Holy One. And because God is moral, the word holy has often begun to denote moral connotations because we always think of God being like when I say God is good, and everybody says all the time. And I say all the time, people say God is good. The idea of God being good is that God is moral. So when we start using holy as meaning a, a moral strength, that someone's holy has a high morality to them, it's because of that connotation with God being the moral one. Calling Christ the holy one evokes several layers of meaning here too. He's the one set apart by God. He is the one who is the moral one. He is the, uh, again, so you just see these ways of calling Christ the holy one gives us a very interesting connotation of both connecting him to God and yet God's purposes throughout the Old Testament as well. Can you see that all right? Or do I need to uh, beat a dead horse? Cool. I won't be the dead horse. He's also called the true one. 
True one is a fascinating uh, uh, piece too, especially to the Greek. Greeks had two words that can be translated true. And one means true as opposed to false. However, John uses the word that means true as opposed to a copy. So like the first one, the archetypal one, the genuine one. Um, and so he's meaning here when Christ is called the true one, that uh, this is the original one that Christians are supposed to copy. Like he is our version. He is our teacher. He's our master. We call him Lord and Savior. But that idea of Lord is something that Christians these days especially have not really wanted to follow. They'd rather just have a Savior, not a Lord. And uh, But the Lord is the one we're supposed to emulate. And in these ways of looking at how we're supposed to imitate or emulate or whatever else, what have we seen so far in Revelation that lets us have a sense of, especially what is John asking them to, how, how is John asking them to imitate Christ right now, who is the true one? Anybody? He well, he's asking him to throw away all other idols and just worship the one God. Is one worship thing. the one God is that piece. Persevere is the one piece too. And be a oh. faithful witness, even <clears throat> to death if need be. So again, this idea of being a faithful witness that we keep hearing over and over again, and we will continue to hear throughout Revelation in different ways, is the one who's a faith. Uh, who's faithful and the one who witnesses to the reality of this God in these present circumstances is imitating the true one, the one that is like the, the original, the genuine article, the fully human one who had that divinity added in. Um, but this is the one we're supposed to be. And I love this idea that like John has of like, you got to be like this guy. Now, Christ is also said to possess the key of David. And we kind of need to turn to Isaiah 22, 22, where we see that same expression. And it says, he shall shut and no one shall open. He shall open and no one shall shut. I mean, those words are actually identical. So, so it's fascinating, again, how often we... We look at things from this and we're like, what does that even mean? And the reason I keep pointing out the Old Testament references is so we can get a sense of, of what that means. And I'm going to turn to that one just real quick so we can read a little bit of that. And now this is about the servant Eliakim. So it's uh, this is first Isaiah talking in the uh, the northern kingdom uh, before it was destroyed by the Assyrians. And uh, on the day to on that day, I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiel. I can't say that name. Hilkiel. Hilkiah. Hilkiah. There we go. And will clothe him with your robe and bind your sash on him. I will commit your authority to his hand and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. Um, the exact same language that we have seen here in Revelation 2 now is being given over to Jesus. The reason, though, that's interesting is because these words in Isaiah refer to the authority that was given to this Eliakim, and he became the financial minister for King Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah was enacting wonderful reforms in the southern kingdom, and, uh, and so this new guy was like the right-hand man, if you will. He was the second most powerful person in the kingdom outside of the king. He controlled access to the king. And so when we see, <coughs> excuse me, don't inhale coffee that's still sitting in your mouth. It's not the best idea. Um, when we see this idea of the keys of David, it's, it's highlighting this incredible incredibly important figure from Isaiah 
who was there to basically be the authority of the king. So if Jesus is now being called the one who holds the keys of David and this door that no one shall open and no one shall shut, because he's holding the keys, it gives that sense that Christ has the authority of God, the king, in that same kind of way, that the controlled access to God is through Christ. And so those are the, uh, the, the explanation, if you will, for the different titles of Christ that we see there. And now it moves on to the I know section. The I know section begins with an assertion here too. Look, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. So again, we really have this wonderful idea and theme of this open door. But what on earth does it mean? And the assertion has spawned several interpretations, of course, because it's this revelation. And there's all sorts of special interpretations of revelation. That's the joy of it. Now, in passages such as Acts 14, 27, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, 2 Corinthians 2, 12, these are all passages too. We're not going to go read each one of them, but each one of these passages is, is referencing the missionary opportunities of the early church to do the work of bringing other people the light of the gospel. And so there's one interpretation and it points to these passages. It also speaks of like doors being open, possibility, you know, the old saying, like if, if one door closes, another opens or something of that nature. <clears throat> this is that idea that there is an open door for people to do this missionary work, to continue sharing all of the good news of Christ. And, uh, and that's what they get to do. Now, although this church has no power, it has kept Christ's word. That's what it said. There's no heresy there. And it's not denied his name when it's been persecuted. And their faithful witness will be rewarded with greater opportunity. That's what this first piece is saying about the open door. Um, and uh, now there's a second interpretation that I prefer, of course. The second interpretation views the assertion against the backdrop of the closed door of the synagogue. So you remember when we were doing Smyrna and we found out how they weren't allowed to go into the synagogues anymore. Basically, the door to the synagogues had been closed on these early Christians. And if you're joining me for the first time or simply forget, what were Christians considered still early on in Christianity? Were they considered some brand new religion or were they Jews? Yes. They were Jews. So if you are Jewish and you're going to synagogue to worship and now Jews are saying, no, you're not Jewish. And they're closing the doors to their synagogues, especially at this kind of church where again, how often have we read things that sound like they're just anti-Semitic? so far in Revelation. Again, fairly often, and so we need to remember that this is being written by a Jew to people who still thought they were Jews. So we need to be very careful thinking that it's anti-Semitic, but they were having doors closed on them. So when it gets to verse nine, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. And, and uh, so if this sense of this door is always being open, that no one can shut, and yet you're having the door shut on you to the synagogue. Now, you don't have strength if you're one of the Christians in Philadelphia. You're weak, but you have not given up your loyalty. And if you're seeing doors shut all around you, what might it feel like to hear any of this read where Jesus, the right hand man of God, the Father Almighty, the, the Son of God, the one who has the keys to the kingdom that no one can open or shut, if you're being shut out of the synagogue and Jesus is telling you there's an open door like this, what kind of hope might you have? Well, certainly better than without that hope. I mean, you have hope. Before that, you have no hope. Amen. If you're like, things are bad and getting worse. 
Now I keep saying that because that's true at John's time. It kind of feels true for our time too, right? Yes, it does. Yeah, if things are bad and getting worse right now, here is John writing to these places, hearing from Jesus, and Jesus is referencing all of these pieces about who he is. He's the keys of the kingdom, if you will. He's got the keys of David there. He's the true one and the holy one. And here's a church that's loyal to him saying, he's saying to them, you get to be like me. Don't stop being like me. You have to be this faithful witness. And the door to the heart of God is open to you and cannot be closed. Now, of course, there is the synagogue of Satan there. Let's find out what that means. Now, based off these two interpretations is how we're going to interpret verse 9 and, and, uh, and what that kind of means about how they'll make you come and bow down, not boy down, before your feet. And they'll learn that I have loved you. Now, this is another verse that has been used for terrible anti-Semitism. And I want everyone to know I have no time for any of that. And if you're ever listening to this for whatever reason, and you think that this allows you to hate Jews, I'm going to quote from 1 John, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. What this piece means isn't about how you're going to have a bunch of Jews fall down at your feet, as I don't think, although that might be. If you have that missionary idea, first and foremost, that this open door means they have missionary opportunities, which, again, I don't believe. These words may mean that many Jews will come to believe that, in fact, Jesus is the Messiah and they will become Christians. And then they'll bow down and worship the feet. Now, following the second interpretation, the one that I actually like, these words mean that Jews will come to see that they are not the only people loved by God. And that God loves Christians, too. You notice the huge difference between those two interpretations? Hmm. Imagine if you're looking at this and, 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 you know, like they're Jews, but they're lying because they don't acknowledge you. But it gets to that place. I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. If Jews are hating you and they'll say these aren't Jews because they're lying, because already we have this idea that goes throughout the Johannine ideas. In the Revelation, the epistles of John and the Gospel of John are all connected in ways we don't quite understand. But they're all the Johannine things. And the Johannine epistles, too, that I've already quoted to say, if you, know, if you hate your brother or sister, that the truth's not. If you, if you say you love God, but hate a brother or sister, the you say you love God, you can't see, but hate a brother or sister, you can't see. You're a liar, and the truth is in you. This is that same kind of peace, I think. By suggesting that there is a day that will come when these people who are shutting the door on the face of these people who are struggling but are loyal, that they'll come and acknowledge that they too are loved by the God they think loves them alone it is an incredible hope. I can't tell you how many times I've met Christians who think that God hates everyone who isn't one of us. Comes the whole idea of chosen ones. Yeah. Chosen ones which was a Jewish idea, then became a Puritan idea. If we've, and, you know, if we've used Jew, like chosen idea, and I'm really comfortable with chosen to some degree, but that doesn't mean that you don't get to say that if like someone else isn't one of the chosen ones, that suddenly God is not for them in any kind of way. Like I get the language of chosen. The language of chosen is fine. I mean, I even like the language of chosen when I have to argue with Christians who tell me that Jews are going to hell, that Jews can't be saved. And I'm like, where on earth did you read that? And like, they'll actually read some part from Revelation, or not Revelation, but Romans for, to me. 
and say it's right here. And I read that same part from Romans and I'm like, no, that says they're the chosen people and they're okay with God no matter what. But yeah. it's fascinating how we can look at things differently here. And what I love about this though, is that hope that one day, all of those who think that they're God's chosen ones, that God has a special relationship with them, maybe we too will find out that God loves everybody. Now, when we get to verse 10, because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Because you have kept, I will keep. Notice the parallel there. I love the way that John uses that kind of stuff. It's almost poetic. It is poetic. And it's stated, as I've said over and over again, and I'll keep stating because I don't want any of us to forget. John expects the pressure on Christians to increase. And I really like that right now because I expect the pressure on Christians to increase during these days. Not because of just persecution, because we're trying to keep the faith, but I suspect that most of us won't keep the faith to begin with. Uh, we're going to start beating our own drums of war and things of that nature as well. We will give up faith and following Christ, continue to use his name, but not do anything that he wants us to do. And that's going to be part of what it means as things get harder and harder. Now, John expects that the persecution that they're beginning to experience is just the initial stage of a greater tribulation that will engulf all people, not just them, but everybody else. And this hour of trial will reveal slash test a person's true character. Anyone like the idea that uh, suffering produces endurance? Well, no. <laughs> Do you remember the first book that we did together? Yes, James. So James, James, yes. What does James say about, about these things? Anyone remember? Yeah. Perseverance. Yeah, it, it's good for you. I mean, it helps you to mature and everything. It's not what we yeah, mean. Yeah, like he, he wants everything to kind of go about this kind of way. And that just doesn't sound like fun for any one of us. And he has that whole kind of thing about, you know, how you get to go through that and how one gets to the other and gets the other gets the other and and like how it even is hope and we don't feel that way about things by and large and yet that's still true for us we get to suffer a little bit in this world that's the nature of the world and if the first little bit of suffering is going to cause us to give up our faith then we probably didn't have faith in the first place so what's our true character? And you can always tell someone's true character when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, right? Right. If you want to find out what kind of person a person is, you're going to find out when you have to be in a battle with them over God knows what. And uh, if there's someone who's going to lose their cool and scream at everybody else and fight and bicker and give up and lose their... And then there's people who are just resolute who know that everything is horrible and yet refuse to give up. And it's those who refuse to give up that you're going to want to stand beside in those moments normally. And that's what John is saying, that there's a moment here that's going to test everyone's true character. And this is going to happen to all of the inhabitants of the earth. No one's getting out of this one. It's a, good, it's, a, it's a parallel expression to all the inhabitants of heaven that we've seen in places as well. It's very fantastically fun. Now, John's going to reveal that all the inhabitants of the earth are those who follow the beast. We're going to see that later when we get to Revelation 6 through 20. And I know you are all very excited to move beyond this earthly realm of 2,000 years ago and get into the heavenly realm where things are insane. Don't worry, we'll do that soon. We'll talk about the beast. So the inhabitants of the earth are followers of the beast who wear the mark of the beast and hence have their citizenship on earth. And the inhabitants of heaven are those who follow the lamb and wear the mark of God 
and thereby have their citizenship in heaven. And as we will discover, these two groups of people respond quite differently to the hour of trial. There's a beautiful scene in Revelation when, the, well, I, it's beautiful to me, but maybe as I describe it, you'll be like, that's not beautiful at all, Karen. Where the great whore dies. And when the great whore dies and all of the wealth of the nations has been going to the great whore, which again is a symbol for Rome, but we're not there yet. And when the great whore dies, all the kings of the earth weep and the saints of the earth rejoice. And as we are even in our own times watching things disintegrate and disappear, are we going to be among those who weep or rejoice because God's still doing a new thing? It's going to demonstrate where we honestly believe our citizenship is. And this is what John thinks. And I'm just talking like I imagine he would. Now, some have interpreted Christ's promise as I will keep you from experiencing the hour of trial. It's something that means like, oh, you won't have to be in it. I'm going to save you from that. And there's others who understand it to mean I will keep you. I'll persevere. You will persevere during the hour of trial because you've, you've been given my grace and my grace is sufficient for you. Does anyone remember where we actually hear grace is sufficient for you? Don't worry. You don't need to know. Let's just tell the story because it's fun. Do you remember how the Apostle Paul said he had a thorn in his side? We don't know who that thorn was or what that thorn was or exactly what that thorn meant. He could have had some kind of infirmity. He could have had someone who was literally a thorn in his side he just wanted to get rid of. He prayed three times that God might remove the thorn from his side. And all he heard from God after three prayers of this is, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I, again, go with this second meaning of what it means to say, God, I will keep you from going through this time of trial. They're going to be held by Christ as they go through the most difficult times. They are not being spared the most difficult times. And those who interpret it as if they're going to be spared the most difficult of times are generally those who think that there's going to be some great rapture before all this stuff becomes really bad. And um, again, I don't believe in any of that, not just because the word rapture never appears in Revelation, but because it just... That's not the way I understand Christ. If, again, and I'll just say this piece. If there are those who think that Christ is somehow going to spare people from the time of tribulation, from the test of the moment, why on earth do we have to witness the temptations of Christ in the wilderness? Why on earth does Christ say to us, we have to pick up our cross and follow him? Why on earth does Christ say in John's gospel, in this world you will face persecutions, but then with a gentle smile on his face say, but take heart, I have defeated the world. This is the Christ who says, take heart, I have defeated the world. I'm going to keep you. The hour of trial will not overcome them because they have access to God's sustaining grace. John believed the end was near. And so he told these people to hold fast to what they have, lest someone sees their crown. And again, that's a victory wreath. It's not like the royal crown. They could forfeit the reward for service rendered to God if someone takes their crown. Now, for us Protestants, that's just a hard thing to fathom. And I'm not going to get into the theology of that right now. But uh, let's take it this way. When a person fails to hold fast to something, there is a high privilege of serving God, and that one's given to another. It's what happened when King Saul was replaced by King David. I mean, uh, again, this isn't talking just of like, you know, your place in heaven. This is talking about what happens in the here and now. If someone takes your crown in the here and now, your idea that you are a follower of Jesus, if that can be robbed from you, Someone else who's a follower of Jesus will keep on going. 
so part of what John's telling them to hold fast in this moment is so that they're the ones wearing it in the end. Don't forget who you are. That sounds like what I've been saying so much of recently. Anyway, those kind of pieces. Now, there's always the spirit promising something at the end for those who overcome, for those who conquer. And here the promise is for those who conquer, they will become a pillar in God's temple. And if you're someone who's already gone to like chapter 21 and you see toward the end of chapter 21, that there is the heavenly temple is God dwelling with humanity. and It's not a literal building. This doesn't contradict that at all. It's not trying to be literal. It, you're not going to suddenly be a literal pillar in God's temple if you overcome. But this is also people who were in a city that was devastated by an earthquake. Don't forget that. Does anyone remember what year the earthquake happened? It starts with a seven and ends with a team. <laughs> seven. <laughs> 17. Wonderful job. You're very, very smart. And maybe I was wrong about that anyway. So what do I know? Um, so this is a place that has a memory of being destroyed by a earthquake. They've changed their name because of the generosity of Caesar to rebuild their city. And then it says in these whole kinds of pieces again, with what the, with the spirit, if you conquer, verse 12, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and you will never go out of it. This, again, is at the end of Revelation, the new heaven, the new earth, and the temple of God is with humanity. But you get to be a part of what God is always destined for everything. And, and because Gene's around, I'll still say predestined for everything. <laughs> I can't help myself. I actually don't see his face, and I don't know if he is around, but maybe he'll go away after that. I'm <laughs> sorry, Gene. Don't go away. I just couldn't help myself. He's um, laughing. Is he? Good, good, good. good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you'll never go. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. So this is a place that changed its name after an earthquake. And here is Jesus saying, you'll be a pillar in the temple of God that can never be destroyed. And I'm going to write my names all over you. So you're being given a new name. And again, now maybe that first, first is God's name. The second is the name of God's city, the new Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven. And there's that third name of Christ risen name and if you're like me and you're like what on earth is that well it's referenced again in revelation 19 12 and while i generally don't like skipping ahead in any of these things we're going to skip ahead to revelation 19 12 just to see what's being talked about and in the midst of this i again ask you to remember how incredible john was at writing like they are, there are references that go throughout all of this uh, back and forth, pieced together. If this was a first draft, which I don't have any idea, but if it was a first draft, if he did this in one draft, this must have been something that was inspired by the divine. And Jesus is talking now in Revelation 19. Well, no, it's actually John looking at Jesus. And uh, so this is what John saw in verse 11 of chapter 19. Then I saw heaven opened. There was a white horse and its rider is called faithful and true. And in, right, and in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. So this is an image of the resurrected Christ, the risen Christ, in the midst of, middle of all these things, right before we get to the end, the great victory. And he has many crowns. So you know that song, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. We get all of that from Revelation, by the way. That's all in Revelation. 
And there is a name inscribed in those crowns that no one knows except Jesus. And he says in verse, where am I? 12 there, toward the end of verse 12, when he's writing all these different names that I will write my own new name. If someone's writing their name all over you, what does that mean? Belong to them. Yeah. You get to belong to God and to this new heaven and new earth, this heavenly realm where this new city of God is. And you get to belong to the one and we never in scripture hear this name at all because it's secret and i like that all right that's philadelphia we have 13 minutes and we're going to do laodicea i promise we're going to do laodicea i'm going to read it <laughs> pastor prerogative starting on verse 14 and to the angel of the church in laodicea to write the words of the amen Ooh, I like that. I just like that. Anyone know what amen means off the top of their head? Let it be so. Let it be so. These are the words of the let it be. The faithful and true witness. The origin or beginning of God's creation. I like all of those things. I guess I'm going to interrupt my own self real quick to be like, yeah, this is the let it be, the faithful and true witness, which is what John has been asking that everyone is supposed to be anyway. And the origin or the beginning of God's creation, notice it doesn't say the firstborn of creation or anything like that, um, or, or the first created thing. But you remember in John's gospel, um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And all things came to being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. We hear it every Christmas Eve, at least if I'm your pastor, you do. And that's the same kind of thing. It's saying that all creation comes from him. Anyway, anyway, anyway. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked? Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> all right. Anyone want to say a couple quick words on what they think that's all about right away? Not real thrilled. <laughs> You're not real thrilled at Laodicea, or Jesus Correct. isn't real thrilled at it. Correct. Yeah, the risen Christ is not real thrilled with with Laodicea there. Um, the wealthy. Did they get? What's that? The wealthy city. No, um, no, they are wealthy, and John has little time for wealthy people because uh, what does wealth often signify uh, to those of New Testament times? Greed. Greed. Oh. Power. No, power. And if you're a Christian and, uh, and you still hold all of those things and you're doing well um, and you're not going through any of the kind of persecution that everybody else is going through, generally, what does that mean? It's like pushing a camel through the eye of a needle. Oh, well, that's using Jesus' words now, but amen to that. 
I mean, if you're going through times of persecution where everyone who has your faith is being widely persecuted except you, chances are your faith isn't all that great. Now let's go to the little thing, because I don't know. Do these slides help, or are they just obnoxious? No. Okay. I'll continue to do them for all of Revelation. Now, Laodicea, obviously, as you can even hear, as you guys quickly pointed out with regards to uh, the wealth, um, it's a lot of commerce going through here. The city produced a glossy black wool garments and carpets, um, which were amazing. So I'm told, um, or so people say, I mean, it's not just hearsay when we're talking about it 1900 years later. It's it's here, 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 say, here, say, here, say. Um, but these beautiful garments that were black and, and these carpets, they were just stunning. It had a medical school as well. And that medical school was famous for its, its ointments for both ears and for eyes. Um, and uh, it also, because of the city's wealth, it was a huge banking center. Um, and so really this is, is you can already see pieces of it, but again, noteworthy for the interpretation of this letter. And I think I've mentioned it before. And it's one of my favorite things about any of these letters and why I've kept trying to tell you a little bit of the history of all of these places is um, the local water supply for Laodicea came from an aqueduct that was from a hot spring. And so by the time it arrived to the city, it was no longer hot, but it wasn't cold either. It was lukewarm. So they were known for having lukewarm water as a, their water supply. And as soon as you know that, when, when you start to hear this then again in verse 15, I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Doesn't that kind of ring a little funnier now when you realize that Jesus is like referencing the one of the key features of that city? Like, it's a fascinating dynamic. It's incredibly artistic revelation. And we fail to recognize any of that artistry until we understand the context to which it was being written. I, I love context, even though I've been accused of undermining the foundations of Christianity and calling into, every, calling into question everything in the Bible because I've asked people to have context. If Christianity can fall because of context when we're reading scripture, then it needs to fall. The context here is actually delightful as well. Again, we know nothing of the founding of this church. Maybe another thing. Uh, it, it was founded by, and I didn't spell that wrong, uh, maybe it's founded by Epaphras. Um, I'm not saying his name right, as it is known in the book of Colossians. Assuming that Paul wrote Colossians, who knows? Um, then he also wrote a letter to the church of Laodicea, but it's been lost. Because if, there is, if Paul wrote Colossians, I think he did, but not everybody thinks he did. Um, there's a reference to writing a letter to a church in Laodicea. But that's as much as we know um, of the church outside of here. Now, the first description of the risen Christ is unique in the New Testament. It's the only time we see this in the whole New Testament. He is the amen. Let the amen shout from his people again. I love suddenly when quotes from old hymns still pop up in my head. Uh, as we already said, it's the transliteration of the Hebrew word, meaning to affirm the statement of another or let it be. Anyone else singing the Beatles right now after that? <laughs> now, John means that Christ is the affirmation and the fulfillment of God's promises. So was it Paul who wrote, I wish you would either be hot or cold? Was that, is that where that expression or was that earlier? Oh, John's writing that right now. Are you asking about right now or a different passage, Steve? Well, I was wondering, you said Paul may have written a letter, and I thought... Oh, I'd... oh, oh, oh. Paul might have written a letter to the church in Laodicea because there's reference to a letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea in Colossians. 
but it's not, we don't know anything. One that there's no, we don't have any proof that that letter exists. I mean, other than Colossians um, saying that there was a letter from it. And we have no idea what the contents of that letter is. So in saying that it's hot or cold, that's just coming straight from the risen Christ through the prophet John to the church in this letter right now. Does that answer your question at all? Yes, I just thought you had mentioned it a long time ago, something about I wish you would be either hot or cold, but it may have been when we started Revelation and you were just... Oh, you know, that's, that's fair. You have heard me mention that before because this is one of my favorite parts of the whole of Revelation. I love, I wish you were hot or cold because then I could just spit you out of my... All right, but because you look warm, I'm just going to spit you out of my mouth. Um, again. So you have heard me say that often. And I mean, I will reference that in different moments when I'm teaching something else. I just like it. So it's not Paul, it's Garrett who doesn't shut up. Much like anybody at the session meeting last night was beginning to wonder about. He's also the true and faithful witness, which is a sharp contrast to the Leto scenes right now who are not this way. And again, this is John's constant desire to get every one of his readers to embody this Christ-like quality. He's now saying, this is a true and faithful witness, be like Jesus. And, uh, and again, this lofty, beautiful description of the origin or beginning of God's creation doesn't mean it was the first thing created, rather it's the agent of God's creative work. Um, if you want to ever see, read, read something that is my favorite part of Proverbs, uh, chapter eight of Proverbs is stunning. It's about lady wisdom creating with God. And so you can see a piece of this idea of Jesus creating or the God, the son or the Christ or whatever, uh, the one whose name is secret, creating with God. Uh, you see it again in First John, you get a little bit of it in Colossians chapter one as well. As such, Christ possesses authority over all of creation. And so, again, these people are dealing with a state that says that it has full authority over everything and is acting that way and is ruining life and killing people and persecuting people and in saying that Christ is the origin of God's creation it's reminding us that over and above all of these earthly powers that can do all sorts of things the final authority and the greater authority is still Christ. Now, we've already read it. I've talked about it. It's uh, the I know section contains only censure and opens with a graphic picture. And it's graphic only because you can see it so clearly. Uh, amen. Amen. Yes, yes. Hey, it's, used, it's normally my dog. So I'm so excited. It's not. Um, and so here's Jesus. I prefer that you were either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. And, and again, we read that and we're kind of like, well, hot makes sense. You want people who are on fire for Jesus, but why cold? Cold might be better than a pretender. Ah, yes, there it is. It's better to not be a pretender at all. They per, like Christ's statement that he would prefer cold than lukewarm might be startling, but to pref now quoting this fellow Morris here, to profess Christianity while remaining untouched by its fire is a disaster. There is more hope for the openly antagonistic than for the coolly indifferent. And it's so repulsive to Christ to have a coolly indifferent, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, what evidence is there of your belief in Jesus? I, I just, I believe you don't need to ask about evidence in my life. Don't try to conflict me. This, I'm talking about religion. You know how those people kind of go. Jesus has no time for them. And, and we see this also in Second Peter, the letter to Second Peter. Again, the church thought that things were going great. I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. 
And their lukewarmness of feeling like, hey, I got what I need. Yeah, I got Jesus too. But this is what's causing them to escape persecution experienced by the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia. They're prosperous materially, but bankrupt spiritually. I love what Jesus says about it too. And I don't love it because I'm happy for them or anything else. I just, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Where again, they say, I'm rich, I prospered, I need nothing. And Jesus responds says, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. They're wretched, literally, the wretched. They lead the pack. Pitiable, that is their need of mercy. They're actually poor in a sense of having nothing at all. It's a, it's a, it's a jab on the city's banking business too. Here they are saying, look at all this stuff we have. And they're in a city that's full of stuff. And Jesus is like, no, you're actually someone who deserves pity because you're poor. They're blind in spite of having a medical school that made eye ointment to make sure that people could see. And mm -hmm. they're naked instead of having, while they have a garment industry that created some of the most beautiful garments that people could see. Do you notice how Jesus takes all of the riches of their city and even though they think they're rich, partially because they exist in that city, rips it all away? <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> and now because they're still rich, he counsels them to buy from him gold refined by fire. What happens when you're refined by fire? It purifies. Purifies. And we see that in 1 Peter as well. It's basically the same thing. And so they might thereby be spiritually rich. The white robe shows back up again to cover their spiritual nakedness. The eyes off so they can see spiritually. This is what Jesus is offering. Jesus is offering them something to keep them from being blind that their city actually makes. And while their city makes black garments, he's offering them a white robe. Like he's basically telling them, you need to do the opposite of everything that you're doing. And then he says, all of this is because of my love. <sighs> Oh, discipline is truly a mark of love, though, right? It is. Yeah. I mean, I think that so often we see just judgment. And there's certainly things in the Bible that appear to be just judgment. But he pleads with them. He's begging them to repent. Not so much because, you know, like, or else I'm going to bleh out of you forever, but it's like hell to live without this kind of honesty of character. And Jesus knows that. The repentance and exhortation section of the letter concludes with this vivid image. Look, I love this piece too. God, I... I love the letter to Laodicea the most. And it's just awful. But this is beautiful. Look, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. And note the verb is in the present tense as if saying, I'm continually knocking. I'm here at the door knocking. And notice this though. I stand at the door knocking. If you hear my voice, that word if is such a small word and how much hinges on the word if on so many things in history. I've talked to parents who have said to their children, if you just listened to me. I've talked to children who said to their parents, if you just listened to me. People say of the government, if they just did this. The government says to people, if you just do this. War is being fought. If you just do this, then it'll be all. Everything in the world hinges on the word if. And here Jesus is saying, if you hear my voice and open the door. And he, I'm sure maybe if you've gone down to at least the most famous of all the paintings is, that I know of is the William Hurt one who painted Light of the World. And it crap, 
captures that crucial importance of the human response in this famous painting scene where there's no knob on the outside of the door as Jesus is there knocking on the door as if it can only be open from the inside. Jesus can knock, but the door needs to be open on the inside. That's the beauty of love. It's not Jesus breaking in. It's Jesus knocking at the door saying, if you just open it, Has anyone seen that painting? No. Yeah, well, take a gander at Google. I could have say put it in, but it's just, and there's actually others, not just William Hertz. Um, I think his might've been the first, but there are others where they do not paint any doorknob. It's just a door with Jesus knocking there. You know, with his images of a throne and Christ conquering, the promise of the one who conquers subtly introduces the next section of the book. Because the next section of the book, the conqueror here is going to be able to uh, share Christ's throne, gets to sit down on the throne of Christ as Jesus shares the Father's throne. And when we hit chapter four, we are going to have another vision, not just of the Christ walking around these seven lampstands that are the churches and the seven stars that are the angels of the churches uh, or holding the seven stars. But now we're getting another heavenly vision. And in this heavenly vision, we're going to hear a lot about a throne. And it's brilliant that the last thing that the resurrected, the risen Christ says through the letters is for those who overcome, those conquered just as I have conquered, they'll be a part of my throne. And now, Next week, we're going to get to the throne room of God. <laughs> I just can't believe how incredible the artistic vision of Revelation is. I don't know who's talking, but I love it. It's all good. Anyway, congratulations. We're done with the first three chapters of Revelation, and it's only March 9th. Any questions, comments, and or concerns? Mm. Kathy. It's William Hunt, H-U-N-T. Mm. Did I say hurt? Yep. No, yeah, well, that's what happens when I wrote it down wrong and didn't know it well enough to begin with. So thank you. It's William Hunt. Did you find it, Kathy? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 found, I don't know where it is. And I, yeah, I've got it here. Yes. The painting was considered one of the most important and culturally influential rendering of Christ of its time. So 1851. Let me see if I can find it really. Yeah, I mean, it, and it was. It's, um, it's such an influential yeah. and it, it really is a beautiful piece too. Let me see if I can find a quick. Let's have a little, little picture. Yeah, because you need a bigger picture than a little, little picture to kind of do justice for it. Can I expand that? Let's Actually, see if this it sounds works. like one of the pictures that was hanging on most of the classrooms and Sunday school classes. Amen. Um, there, there were things like this in Sunday school classes as well. Um, this is the first one, though, and you can see this door kind of overgrown and things, and, and there's no doorknob on it, though. It's just, just uh, obviously, the risen Christ is crowned with a crown of thorns, um, holding uh, the lights there. It's, it's brilliant. Anyway, uh, William Hunt, not Hurt. Is William Hurt an actor? Yes. <laughs> oh, wrong thing. I mean, how do I stop sharing? There we go. Anyway, so that's what I was thinking. I, I am like, it's uh, so easy for me to get confused away. So thank you, Kathy. Sir. Anybody are else? Talking, are you talking about this uh, Tuesday and Thursday or? I, I am like... not. I offered that, but I'm, I'm not really talking about it. Kathy, how's it been for you? I have gotten a lot out of it, but I like the one in Advent even better. Well, the one at Advent is better. And and I think maybe part of the reason I'm not having to talk about that is because I, I don't, I, I liked it, but I don't love it. And I liked it more than the other stuff I was finding. So yes. um, 
maybe next year um, I'll just uh, I'll I'll write my own and um and, yes. and and we and we can do something about that. Write um, it early enough so you can get it published and others can share it. Because um, this <laughs> this is a writer for a Presbyterian Outlook. Yes. She, yeah, she writes for them. And you had talked about, and I can't remember his name, but the one we had before is one of your favorite Presbyterian pastors and a wonderful woman that wrote the alternating chapters. So Tom Long was, and Danielle Marshall are, yes, are, great, Tom, are brilliant, Long, brilliant. Yeah. And um, they are the brilliant. problem is, you, the problem is I like with that Advent devotion, it was so good that it's like nothing was going to actually be wonderful afterward. Um, I, I still have it by my bed and I read it every night again. And, and so, yeah, so you're not going to get that same one out of this, but you might get some of that idea of look at the ordinary things that are precious. And I actually, and the problem I have with that one, and I, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this where it's live on Facebook too, but sometimes I read that one and I'm like, I could have said that. Better. So, uh, and every time I feel that way, I just like, ah, so, um, I like, I think next year for Advent, I'm going to use the same one again, um, I because would. it's great. It and, is. and if anybody wants a separate one for Advent, um, and again, I have not found one for Lent I've ever loved, to be honest. I've never found a, a Lenten devotion that I'm just like, this is it. Um, but I found three for Advent. This most recent one that we just had, there's one called God With Us that came out by Image Magazine that is very Catholic in orientation and it's very deep and dense. And it's beautiful artwork included in it, but it is stunning and powerful. Um, and then there is one by Ted Loader. Um, and I don't remember what it's called, but it's, um, it's a series of like, uh, more like poems that go through like Christmassy kind of narratives and leading up. And it's those three, each one of them, I'm just like, Oh, so if if anyone finds one for Lent that they think is amazing, let me know. And um, and and Ted, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, get it done and uh, and publish it. My mother would be thrilled if I ever did anything <laughs> like that. Um, publishing is 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 uh, something I don't understand, and uh, and 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 I'm not sure if I will ever have the wherewithal to try to, but. Uh, I, I'm happy to write, so I'll, I'll I'll get it done early enough and share it with whoever wants to share it. But I would love to do the Advent one over again because it was during COVID. We were on machines; I couldn't hear. Uh, we'll talk what was about going the, on on those Saturday mornings. We we'll do something in person and uh, where it's a little bit better, or maybe just on Zoom. We'll figure it out, and we'll we'll have that one so you and I and whoever else wants to talk about that Advent one can when we hit uh, the end of November, Kathy. I promise you. Okay. All right. Let me pray because now it's ten minutes after the hour. God, I just am delighted. I I can't believe how much I like these letters to these churches. I can't believe it. I, I guess I can, God. You know, these are, the Bible is your living word. And thank you for allowing it to come alive to us so that it might make us more alive. And these days, it feel like terror. So thank you. Amen. Amen.